I'm sorry to tell you, Rocco, but your favourite son is looking to move out. Don't worry about Islamic fundamentalists. Anti-vaxxers are the real clear and present danger. Mark McGowan knows this, which is why he's always shifting the goalposts on climate change so we can never really work out what's going on. Another security breach at the McGowan home. Yeah, the second in six months. He's got to move house. Rockingham's dangerous enough without anti-vaxxers coming after you. Too many people, too many nut jobs, know where he lives. Being a man of the people has a downside. People. Nobody knew where Colin Barnett lived. Most people thought it was Cottesloe. It was actually in Claremont. I used to be a political reporter, but I couldn't tell you where Alan Carpenter lived, or Gallup, or Richard Court. But just about everyone seems to be able to pinpoint McGowan's crib. Protests at his house on the weekend ended with someone taking pictures of his family. That's sinister. So it's time to move house. He's been there since 1996 or something. 25 years in Rocco. Maximum for armed robbery is 20. He's done his time. We know he's looking around. He was nosing around Mount Lawley amongst other places in the past few months. I'm sorry to tell you, Rocco, but your favourite son is looking to move out, and it's about time. For the most popular Premier in history, he certainly targeted an awful lot. Most of us love him, but the ones that don't hate him in a way that few Premiers have been. In the days leading to the last election, someone told Labor candidate Paul Lilburn, I'm going to get a gun and shoot Mark McGowan. Now, that wasn't long after someone hurled a package containing powder into the Premier's electorate office. And there would have been God knows how many more threats that we've never found out about. Nothing new for politicians to be targeted, though. No. Fortunately, there's only ever been one political assassination in Australia. That was Cabramatta MP John Newman. He was gunned down outside his home back in 1993-94. We were all a bit shaken when we found out John Howard was wearing a bulletproof vest when he talked to the gun nuts after Port Arthur. In WA, we started taking security for politicians seriously after 9-11. Jeff Gallup had a police escort everywhere he went. He was the Premier at the time. First time that had ever happened. We started taking it really seriously after the Bali bombings because we realised the threat was much closer to home than we thought. I was in the press gallery at Parliament when Colin Barnett, who was opposition leader at the time, took the piss out of Gallup for having full-time bodyguards. That's how unusual it was. Fifteen years later... Barnett opens his letterbox and finds bullets. I guarantee you there were some serious threats made when McGowan put restrictions on the sale of guns and ammo during the COVID lockdown because preppers were tooling up for Armageddon. Well, the first rule about security, never talk about security. Unless you're the Attorney General. McGowan's facing a double whammy at the moment. First, he's famous in a way no other West Australian politician has ever been. And the history books are littered with people who want to do harm to famous people so they can be famous. Second, he's outraged the most zealous, single-minded, illogical, crazy maniacs on earth. Don't worry about Islamic fundamentalists. Anti-vaxxers are the real clear and present danger. There are some seriously delusional, deranged conspiracy theorists out there. Probably climate change deniers. Nationals are on board for 2050 net zero might actually happen. Or not. The first global climate meeting was held in 1992. That's when we started taking climate change seriously. We called it global warming back then, as you'd remember. When that meeting was held, the world was getting 87% of its energy from fossil fuels. 29 years later, with all the advances in wind and solar and batteries, the world is now getting 83% of its energy from fossil fuels. It dropped four percentage points after three decades of action. We now need to go from 83% to zero in the same amount of time. People simply don't understand the scale of the challenge. I don't find myself in agreement with Barnaby Joyce terribly often, but he's got a point when he says we need to talk about the logistics and the cost of this project. We are addicted to fossil fuels. ScoMo will burn 126 tonnes of jet fuel flying to the COP26 summit in Glasgow. One way. Ouch. The world chews through 10 billion tonnes of fossil fuel every year. A guy called Vaslav Smil talked about this recently at a business conference. Vaslav might not be the smartest person on earth, but he'd be in the top 10. He made the point that oil and natural gas is used to make pretty much everything. 
One chicken breast requires a cup of diesel fuel. A small steak, 10 cups. That's what's needed after you add up all the fuel burnt by the tractors and the harvesters we need to make the crops that we feed all the chooks and the cows. And then the trucks and the ships to transport everything to our renovated chef's kitchen. There are four things that make civilised society civilised. And every one of them is wholly dependent on oil and gas. Steel and concrete for buildings and roads and, well, everything really. Plastic which is what everything not made of steel and concrete is made of, not just Shopkins and other stuff, but important things like medical equipment and computers, all from oil. And the fourth one's ammonia. That's where we get nitrogen fertiliser. Ammonia is produced using gas. Now, there are just shy of 8 billion people on Earth at the moment. Without fertiliser, Fastlife says we can feed only half of us. So don't worry about the polar bears not having a place to live. What are we going to eat? I've lost 180 pounds! Well, humans are good at inventing things and solving problems. Look at Tesla. You got one? No. <laughs> How many electric cars are on the road right now? Seven million. How many internal combustion engines on the road right now? A lot. 1.2 billion. Now, you really think the people living in the slums of Mumbai are hanging out to see what's coming out of Elon's garage? Andrew Forrest reckons it's happening and he's deep into hydrogen. Andrew Forrest is hedging his bets. He's out there saying he's green. He's talking up hydrogen. But at the same time, he's building an LNG import terminal at Port Kembla in New South Wales. Like the rest of us, Twiggy's having a bob each way. The state government came out today talking up a new hydrogen project in Quinana. It's called H2 Perth. Well, that's naff. Should have gone the whole way and called it H2 Perth. It's going to produce 1,500 tonnes of hydrogen every day. That's about 500,000 tonnes a year. Guess how many tonnes of LNG we export from WA every 12 months? A lot. 50 million. We supply a lot of the fossil fuel that contributes to the 36 billion tonnes of emissions the world pumps into the atmosphere each year. We supplied the iron ore that made the 1.86 billion tonnes of steel the world produced in 2020. How much greenhouse gas did that cause, do you reckon? Mark McGowan knows this, which is why he's always shifting the goalposts on climate change so we can never really work out what's going on. When are you on this one, my good man? Sorry, dude. Black. In 2017, before he was Premier, Labor was talking about a renewable energy target of 50% by 2030. That's good. Then the policy was not to have a policy. Labor said it would not introduce a state-based renewable energy target. Ooh, that's bad. In 2019, McGowan said he supported Bill Shorten's 45% emission reduction target by 2030. That's good. Two weeks after Shorten lost the election, McGowan said WA could go it alone if Canberra didn't act. That's good. Later that year, the EPA dropped a plan to make new projects carbon neutral in WA and the Premier announced an aspiration to achieve net zero by 2050. That's bad. A year ago, Labor released its WA climate policy, which said categorically that pollution was bad and climate change was real. But we weren't going to actually do anything about it. That's bad. And two months ago, when the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change updated its report, McGowan said he would consider legislating a net zero target. That's good. McGowan says H2 Perth, which is being built by Woodside Petroleum for $1 billion, will accelerate the uptake of clean energy and help our state move towards a renewable energy future and net zero by 2050. Got to start somewhere. True. And the world loves a good hydrogen project. You're such a cynic. Oh, the humanity. I'm Ben Harvey. For more Up Late, click the subscribe button below.